Hello everyone, welcome to the first class of the Pattern Language course. Today we shall be hearing from our guest, Mr. Vinesh Chintaram. He's a practicing architect based in Port Louis, Mauritius, and he's also the Secretary General for the African Union of Architects. Today he will be speaking to us about African cities and their context and he will be laying the groundwork for us to understand the discussion within which this course lies. He will speak to us about African cities, pre-colonial times, during colonial times, and what we are presented with today. So stay tuned. So let me begin by asking you here in this room, what Africa are we speaking about? The past, the today, or the future Africa? This is a fundamental question that I ask myself as an African, as a Mauritian, and as someone who travels a lot across the continent. Uh, I've traveled uh, nearly more than 30 countries, uh, be it the northern part, central, western, eastern, or southern part of the continent. And in each region, we do have challenges, a lot of challenges. But like the VC said, we do also have a lot of opportunities, okay? And it all depends how you seize every single opportunity, okay? And transform it uh, to your advantage. Now, one question, do you know the origins uh, of the word or the name Africa. So this is the original name of our continent, Alkebulang, okay, which is an indigenous name as per certain research. And basically it is the mother of mankind or the garden of Eden, like one would call. So the term Africa has been given to us by others. We may speak about cities, and we keep on speaking about cities. We speak about Kampala, we talk about Nairobi, about Lagos, but you have some precious information about uh, the early migration across the continent. So basically you have the Northern part where you had the ancient, I would say Roman empires imprint. Uh, have you ever heard about Alexandria? Where, where is that today? Ah, this you know, that's good. On the extreme right hand side, you will see, is it right? Sorry, no, left, okay. So you will see a map, which is uh, actually pretty old, uh, nearly, I would say uh, 600 years old, this map. Do you know, this is the first known map of the continent. The oldest map of Africa that we have here today, tangible, is drawn by Chinese. Is it surprising to you? Why? Chinese are everywhere today, no? They were also there before. You think they weren't there before? Or it's just in recent years that they are appearing everywhere in Africa, according to you again. Over the years, if you can see the profile of the continent, the outline of the continent started getting more and more precise. Yeah, okay, maybe it's a bit helpful. Okay, so from the uh, 16th century, okay, you keep on moving to the 18th century and then in the 19th century. And you see how the contour gets more precise with more information. Now, why Africans in between brackets, they they hardly made maps about the continent. They needed to document the navigators, they needed to understand the, the sales road, they had to document, and each time they needed to find, I would say, uh, stop points or port of course, where they would get fresh water, food, and so on. So they started by looking the coastline of the continent, and progressively, they started getting more inland and to, discover a lot of our treasures. It's about understanding our origins and how we have evolved. And that forms part of the pattern that we cannot neglect. It's our DNA, basically, that I'm talking about.
All right? So then you have the map of 1880. It is about the partition of Africa, but it's, it's prior to the partition of Africa because at that time, there were already a number of well-settled, I would say, uh, colonies in the continent, but there were no clear boundaries. So I would say uh, Europeans, when we talk about Europeans, we need to be specific here. We have the French, the British, the Portuguese, uh, and also the Dutch. They were among the most influential, I would say, uh, um, uh, sailors at that time, and they were also amongst the strongest colonies. Uh, they had their strongest colonies all across the continent. And then in 1913, that's where we started having the clear division of the continent, at least on paper, geopolitical cult, okay, where we started having like straight lines subdividing, okay, our continent. So this is it in basic terms. So far, is it clear what I'm trying to build as, I would say, a narrative which exists, which is our history? The one on the left-hand side highlights, again, the various civilizations and then the network that existed in between the civilizations. What kind of network, according to you, existed at that time? Can you tell me? So they were trading between the different empires, the different civilization, there were trades, there were cultural exchange. People were nomads. They were always moving, okay? There were connections from east to west coast of the continent. There were connections from sub-Saharan Africa to the Mediterranean Sea. And we also had connections to the, what we call today Angola, okay? Where we had another kind of civilization here. And also on the eastern coast of, of Africa, where you have uh, uh, the, what I call the Mutupa civilization. So these were trading routes across the continent. People were moving. There were no borders. There were no frontiers. They were trading goods because some goods were available in certain part of the continent. Okay, They were getting sold from certain part of the continent taking it elsewhere. There were also a lot of minerals that were being traded at that time, okay? Precious stones, okay? Gold, among others. Is that something that makes sense to you? And when I speak about culture, indeed, from that angle, architecture also traveled, okay? Architectural styles travel, but were also adapted to each uh, specific uh, context. So now, the map which is on your right hand side, you know, uh, this is also extremely important. Are you aware of the type of trade that was taking place in Africa, which had a very, very negative impact on the continent? Given that there was already a network set, when explorers from various countries, namely European countries, started entering our continent, they've seen the challenges and the opportunities. And like VC said, it, they seized that opportunity on the spot. They've seen their resources, including human resources that were forced into slaves, and they were taken to strategic locations to take them out of the continent. To take them where is a question. So this is also very key. It's the starting point to show how existing networks were being used to exploit resources of Africa. Here it was about not resources in terms of material sense, it was the human capital of Africa our people, right? So I'll speed up just to move to the next part of my presentation. This is the last slide when it comes to the maps. Okay, I have others, but I will skip. It's exactly what we just said. Look at the connection to Europe. You have the tip of Spain up there. Then you have the 
complete west coast of Africa, central part of Africa, southern tip of the continent, and then along the east coast of the continent. All right? Can you name me a few cities? Because we are going to speak about cities, of course. Can you name me a few cities that you know that were greatly influenced during the colonial time, colonial period? Anyone? Yes? Dar es Salaam, very good. Zanzibar, yes, indeed. Cape Town, excellent. So the, the narrative that I'm building here is where we started migrating, we as Africans, our ancestors, even though if I'm, I have a, an Indian look, I call Africans my ancestors, okay? So there were mobility, uh, there was mobility, there was trade, and so on and so forth. Europeans came in during the colonial period, pre-colonial period and colonial period. They entered the continent. They maximized in a way to extract resources using the existing connectivities, infrastructure, adding new connectivities, okay? And transforming the continent that way. And what did they really transform were mainly what I would call the coastal Africa. Now, pre-colonial Africa and the city of the colonial powers. This is a central part of the continent. That's how the city of Luanda was before the arrival of the colonial powers. Who knows, Luanda is the capital of which country? Very good. And Angola is known for which type of resources? Oil? Now, uh, someone talked about uh, Zanzibar, but we had very, a very important part uh, of the East Coast, which is the city of Kilwa. Who knows about Kilwa? You must know. Do we have Tanzanians here in this room? No? No Tanzanian. I was talking about Mutapa, which is a Southern African region empire, uh, where you have Zambia, Zimbabwe, and so on and so forth. That too was a very rich empire. So that was at the pre-colonial uh, period, all right, just to show. And the question is, are we indifferent to that type of situation? Is it indifferent to you? Does it make something to know that some came and changed our identity? Is it normal? Yes, no. Okay, so, well, I'm not doing a history course, huh? far from that. I'm just taking you to the present days and the challenges that we need to, to, to face together. And the Benin city was completely destroyed by the British powers at that time. Okay, so there's no trace about Benin city at all. Okay, but do take note and you may do some research about those small hints that I'm giving uh, as they can be helpful in your day-to-day uh, -day life eventually, may maybe not that much, but uh, for your education and professional uh, career, surely. Now, this map, you know, it's for a European city. Which city according to you? It's written, I've, well, if you look down there, I've been putting the names already. It's an old map of Paris dating uh, back the 16th century. Now, look at the urban fabric. What do you see there? You have a river, the Seine River, okay? And then, do you see straight lines or things like that? Are there straight lines? Louder, please. Yes, no. Very few straight lines. Why according to you? So that's just one question, and I continue with other questions. This one, which city is that? London, south, okay? The southern part of London. What do you see there? Again, a river? and then a very organic city in terms of 
urban fabric. Okay? Very few, I would say, grid type city development or planning. All right? So this is London and this one. So I showed you the French, I showed you the British, now the Dutch, Amsterdam. Here we do have straight lines, but there's a reason why. So Priscilla cannot answer why. Okay, who can answer why we had quite some straight lines? These were waterways that were organized, structured to enable the city to develop. Okay, because the word or the name Netherland basically means below water. So it's basically landfill and they had to channel water and they need to engineer all of these water canals. So that's about uh, Amsterdam, but yet if you look at it from, you zoom out, it's pretty organic as well. All right. And this one, Lisbon. So the Portuguese. I talked about the four super colonial powers at that time. So that's why I just tried to showcase how their own cities were, okay, as compared to the African context, which was already extremely organic. Okay? So according to you, was Africa a pretty developed continent or were the ancient empires, African empires, pretty organized and developed? Or were the, let's say, uh, Western or European cities extremely developed, according to you? Lady. Yeah, no, you can speak. That's your opportunity. Africa was already organized. We had a great interconnectivity from East to West Coast, from Sub-Saharan Africa to Mediterranean Sea, and also to the southern part of the continent. Okay, so when today people come and say, hi, we are going to have railway network, super highways, and so on and so forth. We had those, well, uh, 600 years ago, we had. Okay, so what has happened over the ages? That's the question. Now, let me speed up with a, a quick overview of certain cities. First, look at the map of Africa. You see the, the big island, Madagascar? Mauritius, the small island, is just next to Madagascar. Okay? So basically, Europeans were trading, and remember the earlier map I showed you, along the coastline of Africa, west coast, going down to the Cape of Good Hope, going up the Mozambique Canal, where you will have Kilwa, you will have Zanzibar, up there, you would have Mombasa going further up, okay, and then to India, where you had the East India Company, be it for the French, the British, and also for the Dutch, okay? And they were even going further, okay, to uh, Asia, so I would say China and so on and so forth, all right? So what has been happening in terms of urbanization, that's my point here, is along those sales road, which were super important for the European powers to build their wealth. The idea was to extract resources from the continent and bring those to Europe. And how do you bring those to Europe when, let's say, uh, if we speak about uh, the... Someone talked about Mali and Timbuktu. Who, who is the gentleman who talked about Timbuktu? You, all right? Timbuktu was definitely part of that Mali empire where it was a hot spot in terms of culture, in terms of trade, in terms of architecture, because you have the, the mosque, the great mosque of Timbuktu, and so on and so forth. Now, Timbuktu is inland. How do you extract the natural resources there to bring it to Europe? Do they put it on the back of the donkey and then walk up to Europe? How do they do it? So this is Cape of Good Hope, now called Cape Town, South Africa, which was a hotspot. This is 
uh, again, the quality of the images are too, too bad. But the first diagram up there, it shows how Cape Town was initially and how the urban fabric kept on like uh, getting bigger, urban sprawl and, and so on and so forth. And then you have a Google map of Cape Town as it is today, where there has been a massive development around the port. So this was a starting point. Again, I have historical maps and so on, so I will skip, but it explains what was there before at the, I would say the indigenous people before the arrival of the, the colonial powers and how it evolved with the Dutch colonization. Then you had also the British era, okay? And if ever you can see, can you see the grid lines? They started putting the grid lines, why? Because at that period of time, we already had a challenge in terms of mobility. They needed to organize the city in a functional manner, in a very operational manner, also to mitigate risk when it comes to, let's say, sanitation, okay, and so on and so forth. But apart from the social structure, the urban fabric, there was an economic structure to the city. So everything was organized in such a way to maximize businesses. So Jerome, you see why business is important. During the colonial power, business was a key thing. How to be efficient, to extract the maximum, to export the maximum and make the maximum money. That was the way our cities that we know today started by getting a radical transformation. Hello everyone, my name is Henry Chirunji. I'm a student of architecture here at International University of East Africa, currently in my fourth year. And uh, I'm happy to be part of the Pattern Language course by Obel Award and our university. And uh, from the first uh, lecture, we had um, architect Vinesh Shintaram uh, talking about the history of our, of our continent. And it was an insightful lecture whereby we learned to understand that uh, even the patterns that we may be searching for in this course, we have been living in different patterns as a continent. And uh, we have been living through a system of empires and then there came colonialism, but still there have been things that have been uh, uniting us as Africans and also that have brought us together to create certain patterns. And although we may look at uh, the contemporary uh, patterns, we still live within um, uh, issues that combine us or that bring us together or link us together or network us together, such as trade. And this continues to be evident on the continent. And uh, this was very insightful, especially for us to understand uh, the past uh, and its influence in the present life and also appreciate the past and appreciate our present so that we can be able to make an impact in the future. Thanks for watching to the end. I hope you learned something new today. Stay tuned. See you next time.